cunning slide. Metro Vancouver home sales hit an 18 year low also. They got waterproof stuff, it don't bother me. Batten down the hatches, warnings across BC as we get hit by more wild weather and. In comes Max Contois with a chance to send Canada to the semis. Contois holds and shoots and look at him makes the save. Offside, Team Canada's captain harassed on social media over a missed shot. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We haven't seen this in Metro Vancouver since the year 2000. Home sales plummeting to their lowest levels in 18 years. While prices have also dipped, buying a home for many people is still just a dream. And if you're a seller, you're likely in for a wait. Tina Lovegreen has our top story. We redid the floors throughout, so we did slate throughout the kitchen, uh, new tile in the bathrooms. And when Clark Fryer coughed up $65,000 to renovate his two-bedroom condo on Kingsway, he figured it would be a fast sell. We were hoping that it would go as quick as all the other units in the building have gone. But not a single offer has come in since the listing went up in August. Far different from a similar unit listed six months earlier. It ended up having four offers and selling for about $50,000 more than listed asking in a week. Just a few years ago, I could tell you we did story after story about people lining up to buy pre-sales or paying thousands if not millions over asking price. But now that home sales have hit an 18-year low, the story has changed. We've seen less sales and we've seen prices start to soften and edge downward. Last year, there were 36,000 home sales in Metro Vancouver, a 32% drop from 2017, making it 25% below the 10-year average. Prices have dipped too. At the end of last year, the average price for a home in the region was just over $1 million, a nearly 3% drop compared with 2017. Longtime realtor Ken Leong says when prices are high, everyone competes. But when they're low, people sit back and watch. Buyers are sitting out because they think there are going to be lower prices soon. Even with the market softening, the new mortgage stress test doesn't make it easy for first-time buyers. Their interest rates went up. The banks really, really tightened up. And at the beginning of the year, we really started noticing offers that were falling through. And, you know, all of a sudden an offer would fall through and we'd say, well, why? And they'd say, well, they couldn't get financing. But the prediction for 2019 is softer prices and more selection. Not good for Fryer, who has already had to get a roommate to make up for the cost of renovating the condo. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, it's a similar story in the Fraser Valley, where sales and prices did drop year over year, but there are a couple of key differences. Last year, there were 15,586 home sales in the Fraser Valley. That is a 30.2% drop from 2017. Meanwhile, the benchmark price for a home in the region at the end of last year was 834,700, a nearly 2.5% increase compared to the end of 2017. Now, prices for single detached houses in the Fraser Valley did drop 1.5% year over year, but that wasn't enough to offset increased prices for townhomes and apartments. Well, if you went outside even for a short time today or tonight, there was really no escaping it. Driving rain and powerful winds returned with a vengeance as winter storms slapped the south coast and much of B.C. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. And Joe, still a lot of problems out there tonight. Oh, absolutely. We are still getting pummeled by this atmospheric river almost 24 hours after it first moved in. Now add in winds and rising snow levels and we are starting to see the complications add up. I just wanted to start off with an overview of all of the warnings. Very much still a rain story for the south coast coast, snow and winter storm for the interior, and we do have those winter storm warnings for highway passes, but the rain has been the big story across the south coast, seeing totals now approach 90 to 100 millimeters. And I want to start off on the island where over 100 millimeters has led to some problems on the roads. Highway 18 in Cowichan Valley briefly shut down. We're seeing pooling in Nanaimo and Parksville, and a regular uh, flood watch has just been upgraded from flood advisory. 
advisory uh, to part of Englishman River and Little uh, Qualicum River. So things will be running very high over the next couple of days. Uh, let me take you now to the North Shore where we're also seeing pooling on the roads. This is probably a common story right across Metro Vancouver where our totals are now getting close to 50 to 100 millimeters from downtown Vancouver towards the North Shore. Uh, lesser amounts as you get down towards White Rock, White Rock and uh, YVR, but still uh, we are coming in already at our 10th rainiest January day of all time. That's a mess out there for sure, Joe. And uh, the storm has also made for some dangerous conditions on the local slopes. Yeah, the uh, totals that I was adding up also include those snowfall numbers. Whistler Village over 53 centimeters from when this started yesterday morning. Rogers Pass over 40 centimeters. Uh, same story as we start to head into the interior, seeing those accumulations uh, add up. We have a general avalanche uh, warning for the entire province. Uh, a rare warning issued because of those extreme uh, risks. The avalanche danger is uh, at a level four out of the five for most of the province. Uh, very rare here for the south coast to see it uh, so close to the tree line. I want to show you some pictures though out of Whistler where again waking up to 50 centimeters of snow today. Uh, that kind of accumulation also adding up on the Sea to Sky. It took people three hours to get from East Van to Whistler Village this morning and then the snow changed over to freezing rain, uh, ice pellets and good old rain by the end of the day. So again making things very messy but the avalanche concern uh, still very much there for the next 24 hours. We spoke to uh, an avalanche forecaster and blogger in the uh, village. Take a listen to why he said this is so particularly dangerous. You know it's snowing five centimeters an hour. Um, the winds are strong up top and there's a warming trend and when that happens it can create uh, an avalanche problem very quickly and it's very hard to mitigate any avalanche concerns when it's snowing that hard. And I should also add the uh, Revelstoke or the Rogers Pass between Revelstoke and Golden shut since 6 a.m. this morning uh, for avalanche control. If you're headed out anywhere across the back country over the next 24 hours, uh, there will be delays. All right. Thanks very much, Joe. You're welcome. Communities in the Comox Valley Regional District are being asked to boil their water. The CVRD is currently using their backup pump station as the main station undergoes improvements, but severe rainfall, though Joe was just talking about, has caused the water to become hazy from particles. Residents from the city of Courtney and the town of Comox are asked to bring their water to a rolling boil for at least one minute. Also affected are the water Local service areas of Comox Valley, Arden, Marsden, Camco, as well as Graves Crescent and England Road. More information can be found on the Comox Valley Regional District website. And well, as the two of us get to sit inside yes. here and enjoy the indoors, there are some people who make a living working outdoors. That's true, and uh, that means they do it come sun or rain. Here's what they think about this weather. We're taking down all the Christmas decorations right now, you know, once uh, Christmas is over, Santa's got to go. <laughs> you know, in Vancouver, if you're working outside, you kind of got to expect that it's going to rain. It's better than being out east in the snow right now, so. Yeah, it's not cold, so. It's water. It's only water. You got you to understand that. It's only water. I got waterproof stuff. It don't bother me. It's just water. We're not made of sugar, right? No, it's just water. I don't know. People make a fuss. I was born in Vancouver, and it's nothing. I guess it is all perspective. Yeah, and if you're one of the many people who spent the day working in the rain, we do thank you. A mother and five-year-old child involved in a bizarre accident in Abbotsford on Boxing Day have now been released from hospital. They were found unconscious along with a three-year-old in a car at the side of a rural road by local residents. Investigators are now confirming the three were overcome by carbon monoxide from the vehicle. When the three were rushed to hospital, they were in critical condition. The three-year-old remains in hospital in stable condition and is expected to be released early next week. And carbon monoxide poisoning caused by exhaust fumes leaking into the passenger compartment of a vehicle is extremely rare. But as we saw in Abbotsford, it can happen. So what can you do if you think your car has an exhaust leak? The best things they could do is, if, is make sure the exhaust is not leaking. So take into shop, check for leaks uh, is going to be the best thing they can do. Other than that, uh, if your windows are rolled down a little bit, you're not going to have this issue. So if you are, are worried about it, nervous before you get to a shop, crack your windows a little bit, create some airflow through the car. That way you won't get it, let it all pile up in there. 
Passengers heading for sunnier skies in Palm Springs were delayed for hours today after their aircraft's wing clipped a catering truck on the tarmac at YVR. WestJet says it happened when flight 1722 was being pushed back from its gate. This is a picture from one of the passengers on board. The jet was being taken out of service and another aircraft brought in. The flight ended up leaving more than three and a half hours after its scheduled time. There are more signs of trouble for BC's endangered southern resident orcas. Biologists say two more members of the group, J-17 and K-25, are dangerously thin and will likely starve to death soon. Ongoing Chinook salmon shortages have left the whales struggling to find food. J-17 is a matriarch in the group and researchers say her death would be a significant blow. Killer whales, uh, all of a uh, female's descendants stay with her for life, both male and female offspring and, and, and grand offspring and so on. Um, so the loss of a matriarch is quite a significant thing. The matriarchs are the glue that kind of hold these, these matrilines that also happen to be social groups together. There are only 74 southern residents killer whales left alive. Three died last year and there hasn't been a new calf born in three years. Well, with Canada eliminated from the World Junior Hockey Championship earlier than many expected, fans have been quick to point fingers at certain players for their loss against Finland. One player in particular is receiving the brunt of the blame. In comes Max Contois with a chance to send Canada to the semis. Contois holds and shoots and look at him makes the save. That miss by Captain Maxime Comtois in overtime Comtois could have put Canada to through to the semifinals. Instead, the game terrific. went on and Canada Finland would go on to win, eliminating Canada from the tournament. The all right, and a bit of drama today. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us now live with more. Dan, what are people saying about Comtois? Anita, first of all, Maxime Comtois says it simply. He tried to score and he didn't. Comtois says it's not the first time he's missed a penalty shot and it likely will not be the last. But the miss in the World Junior quarterfinal last night has drummed up a froth of anger online. And some of these, to warn you, are quite nasty. Take a look. One of them says never trust a French Canadian. Another says he doesn't belong to this species, whatever that means. And I'll say it again, Comtois may be the worst world junior captain in history, dove all over the place, no, showed no heart in this tourney. Now Comtois' agency rep was quick to jump to his defense, saying it is shameful and incomprehensible that a few cowards who can hide behind social media could make such vicious remarks on these young men's character after they battled their hearts out for their country. It was Maxime's idea to use this as a learning moment for all the youth in Canada that cyberbullying is a real problem. And like all bullies, we need to stand up to them and call them out for what they are. Now, amid all of that negativity towards Comtois, there are people who stood up for Comtois online on social media. Take a look at these. People saying things like, you did your best, no shame in that. Thanks for trying and playing your heart out. Ignore all the negative if possible. And Comtois is a talented athlete. The world is his oyster. He lost a hockey game. Emphasis on game. You win some, you lose some. Go easy on him. Also, Hockey Canada was asked about all this today. Have a listen. We, uh, you know, we kept together as a, as a group. We allowed the players to visit with their families. We got them back to the hotel here, went into the players' lounge, played some ping pong, ate some pizza, tried to occupy some time and put them to bed. Okay. There's a point in time where you've got to leave, leave them at, the, at their, uh, their uh, hotel door, and um, that's okay. So, yes, Canada lost at home. Comtois didn't get that penalty shot, and Finland eventually won. But as we heard from fans last night outside Rogers Arena, disappointed as they are, there's always next year, people. Anita, Mike. All right, thanks very much, Dan. And if you are just joining us, remember you can catch up on everything you missed by visiting us online. Just search CBC Vancouver on Facebook and YouTube, or you can visit cbc.ca slash bc. It's also a great option if you want to watch the newscast live and aren't near a TV, or if you want to watch commercial free. And it was a, a close call for one driver and a miracle everyone survived. That's coming up. Good evening to our viewers watching us on our website, Facebook and YouTube. Well, earlier this week, it was the 99th annual polar bear swim. 
I thought Mike was going to take part, but... Yeah, you thought. I thought. Yeah. I was hoping for it. <laughs> uh, so tonight's throwback, we it's Throwback Thursday, if you didn't know. We thought we'd go back in time for a look at what the event was like in 1987. Wow, back when uh, swimmers were actually allowed to drink yeah. on the beach. Former CBC reporter Rod Mickleborough filed this report for us from the 68th annual Polar Bear Swim. You have to be a little crazy to drown your New Year's Eve hangover in English Bay, but several thousand freezing maniacs do it every year. And every year, the costumes seem to get kookier and the drinking a little more obvious. One, two, three. But everyone seems to have a good time, and not everyone can wait for the mass dunking to begin officially. When the icy plunge finally gets going in a big way, it's bedlam. And when it's all over, the question is the same every year. Why? It was um, a very cheap, cold thrill. Yeah! Well, I've never been in the ocean before. And, How cold are and, uh, you? Never in the cold before. And thought I'd do it before I died, you know? I'm still wondering why, actually. I don't know. Uh, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever done. Something to do? Why? Tequila gives you strength. <laughs> gives you strength. Organizers agree the event is getting more spirited than it used to be. It's rowdier this year, more <laughs> costumes this year. People, I think, are pretty excited about 1987. And what about all that public drinking? It's difficult for the police, but they, they watch it very closely and, uh, and make sure that everybody behaves. But later, there is an incident as several inebriated swimmers take each other on, forcing police to intervene. For just about everyone else, however, the polar bear swim is still a shivering good experience. It's fun. Yeah. Best thing I've ever done, you know. In your whole life? In my whole life. This How old great. are you? 19. This is, this, you know, hey, I've been to Germany and this, you know, this takes it. This was the best. I wonder if he'd still say that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Rod Mickelbrough with that report from back in 1987. A lot of... A lot of bikinis and a lot of booze there on the beach. Mullets and yeah. big hair. All right, we will see you back here soon. A New Year's resolution that I will realistically keep? Read a little bit more. Not, not out loud into a camera, just read. Wear turtlenecks more often on air. I'm hoping to do a little bit more exercise in 2019. I've got some great memories in my phone. This is the year I'm going to actually download them, print them, and put them into albums. There, I've said it. Oh, my resolution is never have a bad meal. It was a very close call for a driver in the Toronto area last night. Uh, he or she was on a highway when a piece of a truck cargo came loose and smashed right through the windshield. And CBC Toronto's Adrian Chung reports police say it's a miracle no one was killed. The difference between life and death in this case is a matter of inches. This after a piece of plywood hurtled through the air and through the windshield of this car on Highway 410. The people inside the car alive to tell the tale. I realize, okay, oh my God, this thing has happened. And uh, that at the moment, I can't, I can't see anything. I just stopped talking and I was shocked. She says the piece of wood came off the back of a truck in front of them. They had no time to react. Covered in glass and blood, they say few drivers stopped to help. No one, no one. Yeah, I'm surprised. Like the car is just going they just want to cross the car they don't want to stuck in the traffic this is the car that Jaspreet was driving and she says it was just a matter of seconds that she saw the piece of plywood fly through the air and go right through the windshield 
Yeah, within a second. Glass shards flew everywhere, and the piece of plywood hit Jaspreet's arm. They have some cuts and bruises, but no serious injuries. This woman, having moved to Canada just days ago, is in complete shock. The piece of glass all over the body here and on face, eyelashes on. Did it cut your nose? Cut on nose and cheek. The OPP paid a visit to the family home to check on them. Witnesses reported the license plate of the truck and where the piece of wood came flying from. Drivers, they say, have a serious responsibility. It could have been so much worse, and this is something that uh, we just need to remind people, if you're going to be carrying any kind of, kind of load on your vehicle, uh, on a trailer, it needs to be properly secured and strapped down. You're going down the highway at 100 kilometers per hour, uh, you're catching a lot of wind. Now, the OPP have made contact with the owner of the truck where the piece of wood was seen flying from. They're trying to figure out who was driving the truck at the time, and the OPP are not ruling out the possibility that charges could be laid. Adrian Chung, CBC News, Toronto. Well, things are about to get even more challenging for U.S. President Donald Trump. Today, a new U.S. Congress was sworn in and Democrats took control of the House of Representatives. It ends the Republican Party's total grip on power in Washington. And as Paul Hunter reports, the new House leader isn't wasting any time taking on the president. And that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which you're about to enter, so help you God. I do. Congratulations, Madam Speaker. It is the third most powerful political position in America, Speaker of the House of Representatives, and it makes Democrat Nancy Pelosi now, in effect, leader of the Donald Trump opposition. As of today, she and her party control this place. And while much has been made of all the newly elected fresh faces, a record number of women on Capitol Hill and more diversity than ever, today the real focus was on Pelosi, who signaled she's set to take on Trump, not least his divisive policies on immigration. On that, Pelosi quoted a revered Republican. He said, if we ever close the door to new Americans, our leadership role in the world will soon be lost. Ronald Reagan. But the to-do list for Democratic lawmakers is a lengthy one. Today, Pelosi pledged action on climate change to strengthen gun control, to lower the cost of health care and more. As for the president, the key question is, what about him? It's believed Democrats also want laws protecting special counsel Robert Mueller. As well, provisions forcing all presidential candidates to hand over their tax returns. And there's already talk of a push, yes, to impeach Donald Trump. Democrats can now also launch congressional investigations, and they're likely to examine whether Trump has obstructed justice, profited from being in office, broken campaign finance laws, and cheated on his taxes. It's a new political world for the president. Uh, if he's having a struggle with the old political world where Republicans had a majority in the House and Senate, get ready for a new day. Then there's that border wall, sticking point in the ongoing partial government shutdown. Trump himself today stunned reporters with his first ever trip to the White House briefing room to press Democrats into signing off on tax money to build that wall. Without a very for strong form of barrier, call it what you will, but without a wall, you cannot have border security. It won't work. Said Pelosi tonight, not a penny, as both sides brace for a complicated, bitter, hard-nosed period of toe-to-toe -to -toe battling and deep-dive investigation into everything. It starts now. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A BC charity is pulling its clothing donation bins after another death. Coming up, the growing call across the country for a total ban.
And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So we figured once we do a really nice renovation, it'd be quite easy for us to get out and get into something more suited to us. Home sales in Metro Vancouver have plummeted, hitting a low not seen since the year 2000. Last year, the number of properties sold was down nearly 37 percent from 2017 and 25 percent rather below the region's decade long average. Three other jackets under here. One's a heated jacket, battery heated jacket. If you ventured outside even for a short time today, there was no escaping this. The south coast is being hit by another powerful storm. It's caused flooding and road closures. Avalanche warnings are up in many areas. They are designed to take clothing donations, not lives. But at least five people in BC have died after becoming trapped in donation bins the latest this week in West Vancouver. The organization behind the bins, Inclusion BC, has now decided to remove them from around BC, all 146. And as Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, some communities are taking action as well. I cried. I couldn't believe it. The news of yet another death in a clothing donation bin hit Loretta Sundstrom hard. Her 45-year-old daughter Anita Hawk died in 2015 after getting stuck in a bin in Maple Ridge, B.C. She was homeless and collected clothes from bins for other homeless people. She would bring them to my house and wash them if they weren't clean or if they had a smell to them. And she would give them away to whoever needed them. Sundstrom says something has to be done about the bins. Shut them all down and then get a designer and redesign these things. The latest tragedy happened in West Vancouver. A 34-year-old man died on Sunday in a bin similar to this one. The city has now closed all bins. I think the next step has to be investigating different bin designs or modifications of these bins. And the city of Vancouver issued a statement late today saying about 90% have been removed. Any remaining bins will be removed in early 2019. And that alternative options are available to donate used clothing, including thrift stores. But those who work with vulnerable people say action should have been taken long ago everywhere. Let's save some lives and also just make sure that these bins serve their function um, and get and allow people to donate to people in need. Engineers are working on ways to make safer donation bins. I think Anita would still be here if that design would have been made a long time ago. In the meantime, Sundstrom hopes no one else will die the way her daughter did. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, it's 629 and you're looking at a live shot of a very blue BC place on this rainy Thursday evening. How long will the wicked weather last? Johanna has your full forecast next.
cool. Mm -hmm. This has been a big start to 2019 for SpaceX. Yeah. There's been a lot of space. Yeah, with New Horizons on the first, first landing on the dark side. Yeah. I feel like this could be a good year. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> All right, well, thanks. <laughs> From space to politics, some strong words from China today on the two Canadians detained in that country. A sign the diplomatic battle may press on for some time. That's next. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the PUSH International Performing Arts Festival. Expand your horizon and catch groundbreaking performances January 17th to February 3rd. And get your tickets and join CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Dan Burrett as they co-host
world. CBC Business reporter Scott Peterson explains. For the first time in 20 years, Apple, the phenomenally successful iPhone maker, has had to admit to slowing profits. The company says it can't maintain its surging profit levels in the foreseeable future. It's a major concession. And the reason, an unforeseen slowdown of sales in China. It's yet another indication that the Chinese economy is slowing and the rate of the decline has caught many by surprise. While China's economy is still growing by about 6.5%, higher than many countries, it's China's slowest growth in 10 years since the global recession. The once invincible economy has been hit hard by an avalanche of bad news, from the escalating trade war with the U.S. to declining manufacturing, auto production, and real estate sales. And all this has resulted today in triple-digit pullbacks from the TSX, the Dow, and tech-heavy Nasdaq markets. And the worry for markets and companies like Apple is that if China's strong economic growth is in question, so too is economic growth around the world. So for thousands of companies betting on continued growth in China, Apple just might be the first company to do a major revision. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. Beachcombers along the Dutch shoreline have been hauling in quite a windfall over the past couple of days. The contents of dozens of containers swept off a large cargo ship during stormy weather in the North Sea are still washing ashore and the cleanup is underway. The Dutch Coast Guard says up to 270 containers tumbled from the deck of one of the world's largest container ships. Some broke open, spilling car parts, IKEA furniture, flat screen TVs, clothing, and light bulbs into the sea and onto multiple beaches. Ships in the area are being warned to watch for partially submerged containers. <laughs> Saskatchewan has the highest rate of youth suicide among Canadian provinces, and the crisis has touched the lives of many people, especially in remote communities. In one northern village, though, people are using photography to help heal. The CBC's Madeline Kotzer has their story. Skylar LaRiviere sees opportunities for photos almost everywhere. It's cool. Awesome. Looking up and down. The 16-year-old captures each snapshot with a careful confidence. On this cool fall day, she's with a group of amateur photographers. They're winding their way through boreal forest to the base of a waterfall to take pictures. A few months ago, it was a very different story. La Riviere was alone in the forest, ready to give up on life. She survived three suicide attempts in a span of six months. I almost pulled the trigger to my head and but I was just like I thought about it like there's more to to this than like what's happening right now like I have a purpose in life. La Riviere got help at the northern village of Pine House's medical center. That's where she met Dre Irwin, a primary care nurse who invited her to join the Pine House Photography Club. Irwin discovered photography's therapeutic power during a painful breakup in 2015. The following year, he moved to Pine House, and one night, a routine trip to let his dog out turned into an awesome discovery. The sky was dancing over Pine House Lake. I remember looking up thinking, what the heck? What is out here? Are you kidding me? Irwin's Northern Lights photos started getting attention on Facebook from people in Pine House. Soon he realized photography could maybe help others who were struggling. <laughs> <laughs> on clear nights like this one, the photographers are outside. For many of them, these meetings have warmed up their world. With you. Everything happens for a reason, right? <laughs> Lewis Iron joined the club shortly after his stepfather took his own life. Things looked dark for a while. The 15-year-old became suicidal. But once he started taking pictures, his perspective started to change. I feel like God sent somebody to like create this group because it's actually really, really helping me a lot. Nights spent around the fire, taking photos, are a world away from the parties with drugs and alcohol. After seeing the difference photography was making, elders decided to introduce it into the community's addiction treatment program. Jenna Nata Megan was one of the first to pick up a camera. And you just forget about everything because you're too busy looking at the beauty. Like you're too busy getting that perfect angle. The 33-year-old mother of three is a recovering crack addict. She took thousands of photos of the son during her month in rehab. 
She takes all your problems away. That camera can do a lot to one person. The Pine House Photography Club has caught the attention of social workers across Canada. And it's received a substantial grant from the federal government to set up a studio space. For members like La Riviere, it's illuminating a pathway forward into the future. When I get older, I want to show them how much I like became stronger and better, like wiser. Madeline Kotzer, CBC News, Pine House, Saskatchewan. To Calgary now, where one woman has been quietly helping those in need for more than a year. She set up a free pantry in her front yard, kind of like a miniature food bank. Yeah, it had become so popular, she was struggling to keep up with demand, so she turned to social media for help. Dan McGarvey with that story. Lots of pasta, rice. Margot Baker restocks her little free pantry with her daughter, Taylor, outside their home in Abbeydale. She says many here are struggling financially. The, the socioeconomic need is, is so strong in this area. There's a lot of immigrants, there's a lot of people who, um, who are dealing uh, with things like disabled family members and all of their money goes towards looking after each other. So there's not necessarily a lot at the end of the month. Kids get breakfast here on the way to school. Others come under cover of darkness to quietly take a few essentials. Margot's been paying for everything herself, but says the demand for the pantry is getting too much. That pantry actually uses more than we eat in a month. So it was, so I posted on Facebook yesterday, uh, like not very long ago, asking just for ideas, not for handouts, not for donations. Um, and it's been overwhelming. People are, people are coming out of the woodwork everywhere. It's wonderful. Baker turned to Facebook as a last resort after she says appeals to local politicians, the city and supermarkets were all ignored. Um, well, I was up till three in the morning trying to respond to messages um, and I woke up to a whole slew of them again. There's been so many um, and uh, people are saying this is so wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Um, uh, what can we do to help? What can we bring you? Please give us a list. Um, how do we fill it? What, what, what's the best thing that we can do to help this? And it's really wonderful. I have, um, I have people coming by today with uh, carloads of food. She says now her shelves can stay fully stocked, helping others through one of the most difficult months of the year. Dan McGarvey, CBC News, Calgary. Well, it went missing more than 40 years ago. Coming up, a sweet reunion for April Wine's frontman after a mysterious call on Christmas Eve.
Miles Goodwin is having a hard time keeping his hands off his favorite guitar these days. That's because the front man of the band, April Wine, great Canadian band, last held it more than 40 years ago. The Nova Scotia musician had all but given up after losing his beloved Gibson Melody Maker. Until he got a mystery call on Christmas Eve. John Tatry has the story. Yeah, this is it. These are the pickups that I put in. Miles Goodwin fell in love with his Gibson Melody Maker in 1968. He bought it in Cape Breton and used it with his band, which was about to break big. I used it up until 1972 on April Wine's, uh, two of April Wine's records. And it would have been played on this guitar. Then there was a truck crash. Goodwin was told his Gibson's neck was broken. He played on without her. Hits like You Could Have Been a Lady and Bad Side of the Moon sent April Wine to the top of the charts. This was my life. This was my baby. My baby disappeared. She was 10 when she was taken from me, and she was 56 years old when she was returned. She missed a lifetime with me. He never forgot his old friend and posted online about the lost Gibson once in a while. And then, a Christmas miracle of sorts. The day before Christmas, I got a message on Facebook, the 24th of December, 2018, saying, I know where your guitar is, your melody maker. I said, yeah, in heaven. <laughs> no, it's in Victoria, B.C. He knew right away it was his. The design is his, and his name is on the head. The only thing missing were the memories. This was, in one case, in a living room as a conversation piece for 15 years. That's like, it, like it being in a zoo, and people go by and stare at it, you know? It's, it's heartbreaking. And uh, it missed out on years of all the great April wine hits, like Roller, I would have played Roller on this back then. Yeah. I would have, been, would have played it on this, but I didn't, <laughs> you know? But I did play. She came home this week via FedEx. It's been a wonderful time to fall back in love. Rock and roll is a vicious game, but it sometimes it's a happy ending, you know. Goodwin will use the Melody Maker on his next blues album. He doesn't want to lose his love again, so if you want to hear it live, you'll have to come to Nova Scotia. John Tatry, CBC News, Halifax. Never said how it went missing in the first place, did he? No. Yeah, I feel Just like that's still the mystery. Rock, yeah, rock and roll memoir yeah, comes exactly. soon. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or well, maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't know. All right, just to make the new year a little more memorable for everyone, a young moose paid a visit to a Calgary neighborhood earlier this week. I followed it out here to the backyard and it uh, pushed over a flower pot and uh, seems to be having a, an enjoyable time now after feasting on my birch tree. The moose dubbed Molly by area <laughs> homeowners was in no hurry to leave. <laughs> she strolled through several front yards, sampling the various plants, then opted to spend the rest of the day resting in Harry Sambell's backyard. I mean, that does look pretty comfortable. I said it was a moose on the loose. Doesn't look like it's, look like it's <laughs> no, going too far. Not moving anywhere. Yeah, it's got everything she needs. <laughs> Lots of snow on the ground there. Oh, yes. yeah. Just a reminder: you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca/bc. Our next local news at 11 o'clock with Mr. Dan Burrett right after the national. Have a good night. Good night.